Malik and Shin. Jeremy Kroger. on the tree red side runs through the 601 108 miles per hour That's a pretty good start for our 2022 race season i see a black mark out on the racetrack the first black mark of the season on a brand new racing surface This is Harold Habian, the new Camaro. 
1984 South Carolina cars. Pick it up. During the off-season, I'll uh, be right there. 28 for a few years. Uh, this is a new ride for Harold. We got Tammy Dixie. El Camino, hopefully. First, you're in the Woodstar side, 93 miles per hour to a 903. 79 from Tammy. Bob Vandewater. 1971 Dodge Challenger. The Woodstar side, taking on. Ken Bigelow. Maybe that's Ken. Bigelow Bolt. Step with you. Exterior. Front 696 at 97 miles per hour. 686 at 100 miles per hour left side. K77, Camaro left landing on the yeah, pockets racing, pocket change, Thunderbird, Alley Ducker. Of course, at the counter. We got lots of them. See us here at the time 
power. We got them up here. Mustang left lane, Rob Kalkowski. Sanford, Michigan, taking on. Place the six. The uh, GMC pickup truck, Icus Performance Lane. comment on our live video on Facebook on NMD Racing Unity. Chris Hardesty says it's still a little cold up here. I don't know how it's sweating out there. Seven seventy five. Good for the Ford. Eight ninety nine for the GMC. The racers get the first pass of the season. As you see, most of these guys are. Some have been up twice, but now. Dale Marvin, 35 on the tree. Last year's bracket, two was champion. Run through. Oh, we got something fell on the track down there, guys. The left lane. That's a 721 at 96 miles per hour. something in the track. It fell right on the uh, center line down there, but it's at about 200 feet past the finish line. There's something fell off the back of the S10. So we'll have to run down and get that. Also, first let me know that the, so if you're trying to make a pass without a tech card, that's a no-no. You have to be... Uh, Paid the $20 to test and tune today and turn in a tech car before you make a time trial. That's a very strict rule. Thank you. So let's get live on Facebook here. We've got uh, junior dragsters coming up for their first passes. We've got Anna Circa, Ava Sabula, and we are all clear, Tom Ben. We're good to go. And on her first left side, and circle around the 969, 65 miles per hour, 962 for Ava. That might have been Nathaniel, actually. NC6. Good matchup there, only 400 separate them at the finish line. I couldn't tell who got there first. Oh, 
six of them in a row over there at the fuel racing camp. That's 78 miles per hour. Nice uh, maiden voyage and her new racing ride for the season. there for Nevea. Nevea is heaven spelled backwards. Pro 66 ET at 47 miles per hour.
Sure, that 851 ET at 80 miles per hour of the Mustang. Here is David Evans. Monte Carlo, here in the left lane. Woodstar Forestry side, your five time defending Pro Trophy track champion, including last season. Set at the banquet. He's not doing pro trophy this year. He'll still run pro trophy, but he's going for the bracket two championship. That was his words. 
us back up here left side.
Oh, that's 
Good morning, it's Sunday morning. We're going to Muskegon.
What's going on at the Wagner Center for a Bingo. Bingo, yeah. Bingo. Bingo. Regular bingo. Several years ago at the county fair, they used to play bingo. They had that one room. Oh, cool. uh -huh. Beaver. And I don't see that anymore. I think COVID I had to say that really put a crimp in everything. I really did. Now I guess it's starting to come back more and more. Del Casca had to do a show festival. Center. This is Chris Johnson, our assistant director. We just want to thank you guys all for coming today and thanks to the Manistee Library. You need to be louder? Is that okay. Okay. Thanks to the Manistee Library for in inviting us here today and we can share our passion about raptors with you. So Skeegamog Raptor Center is a 501c3 nonprofit <coughs> raptor center that's dedicated to rehabilitation education and research. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work we do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what a raptor is and some of their unique uh, adaptations and then you guys are gonna get a chance to meet our two education ambassadors and we'll be happy to answer questions for you. So the first work we do is rehabilitation work. Um, we admitted 74 patients last year in our first year. Uh, about 80% of those were uh, hit by from, from vehicle collisions. Uh, that's the number one cause we see birds. We actually got several from down here from Manistee. Um, we uh, work with the Little River Band. They help us out get a lot of birds transported up to us. So um, as we go through today, I'm just going to kind of talk about you know some things that you guys can do to help protect raptors and the environment. That's why we're here today. We just want to talk about ways we can make it possible. So when you're driving, one thing you can do is just be aware of your surroundings. Um, I know we all have our little magic screens that we carry around, but maybe kind of tuck those to the sky and not texting um, while you're driving, talking on the phone, checking your emails. And when you see a raptor or any wildlife on the side of the road, just try and slow down and give them a wide bird. Uh, you know, especially the larger birds that we work with, like eagles and vultures. They'll kind of eat themselves into a food coma if they find roadkill on the side of the road, and then they have a hard time getting off the ground. So they just, you know, they need kind of some space. And, you know, we hate to see anything get hit. So, you know, that's, that's something I kind of preach a lot just because we get a lot, a lot of cases. You know, a lot of fractures that are irreparable, uh, head trauma that birds don't recover. Some of the other things we deal with are common sicknesses, West Nile virus, we still get some birds in with West Nile, uh, fungal infections. Um, we have, in the fall, we end up with a lot of young birds that come in just, that are starving them because they haven't figured out how to hunt. So we end up uh, getting a lot of those youngsters, trying to get them turned around and get some weight back on them and then do some hunt training and get them back out and do the second chance. So, um, Another thing that we're dealing with right now, and this is kind of new for us, is the avian influenza. I'm sure some of you guys have seen that in the news. Uh, that is for raptors, highly lethal, is 
is a 90 to 100 percent mortality rate. We'll get to questions in the end, okay, bud? Yep. Um, so that's been uh, really tough for us right now. Um, it's really added a lot of cases. Uh, and it's, it's a lot like COVID, you know, we don't know a lot about this new strain. Uh, we know it's legal to raptors, we don't, you know, but there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, I do believe we're seeing it in the area. One of the things that's made it tough to treat it or to uh, find out what it is, is if we can get the bird stable enough, a lot of those symptoms are similar to lead poisoning. So, um, it requires a lot of extra work. I have to wear a suit and gloves and masks, and then when I get done treating, I mean, we have to quarantine every new patient we do. We have to just send swabs out. So it's really added a lot of extra work and kind of put a huge strain on us. But we're trying to do the best we can so we can protect our other patients that we have. Um, so far, any of our cases we've been able to stabilize. We have not had a positive comeback, but. Uh, I did admit two, two eagles that were done on arrival this weekend, and um, I'm highly suspicious that was what it was. So uh, we're, we're waiting on results from the state lab on that. So um, one other thing I want to talk about with this time of year especially is with young birds. So oftentimes a lot of birds, young birds, will end up on the ground. And I just really want to emphasize it's not a good idea to just pick the bird up and assume the parents aren't taking care of it. My suggestion would be to contact, uh, rap, you know, if it's a raptor, you can contact us. If it's another species, you know, you can find a list of uh, wildlife rehabilitators on our <coughs> website. Uh, raptors especially are, I'm partial raptors, so I'll just say especially. Raptors are great parents. They will continue to take care of they're young on the ground. But sometimes it is necessary. So it's really best to just each situation, you know, give us a call and kind of talk it through. We do have a, a baby great horned owl and a baby barred owl right now uh, that we decided to take in because of the cold. We wanted to get a few days to get it warmer and get some, you know, more food in a month and grow up. But our goal is to get them back with their parents. So um, I've actually asked my son to drive out from Grand Rapids because he's a rock climber and he's going to find trees for me this weekend and we're going to try and put him back in the nest. So, um, and our, our other uh, education, we actually just added this component. Uh, we did our first program a week ago today. You guys are our second program. We have two birds we brought down. We have Pearl. Now Pearl has a really special place in my heart. She's a former ambassador bird for Wings of Wonder. Uh, Chris and I both met volunteering at Wings of Wonder, and I, I started on this journey, I went to a program down at Cadillac Library in 2006, and Rebecca got Pearl out, and here I am. So I'm really, I'm really excited that she's now part of our organization, um, so you'll get to learn more about her story. And then making her debut is Esther. We have Esther is a Broadwing talk. And um, she, she came in to rehabilitation last, last year. She's a young bird, a 2021 hatchling. So we'll talk about her story, and we'll, you, know, you guys will get to ask questions and we'll see the birds. I'll see how the birds do if we can. I know this is a large room, so we'll try and walk around a little bit, give you guys all a chance to kind of see the birds. Uh, we'll maybe try and keep them out afterwards. We'll maybe stay behind the tables if you guys want to check out the biofacts and wings and feathers and stuff and ask questions to you and get a chance to see that then as well. So our third uh, part of our mission is research. And we've chosen two research projects this year. Uh, our first is uh, Chris, is our resident kestrel expert. I'm going to tell you, let him tell you a little bit about the first research project and then I'll talk a little more about our second one. And then we'll get, the, we'll get to the good part and get the birds out. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me in the back? No. Uh, okay. I'll try and get it. Um, so, who has seen an American kestrel? Raise your hand. An American kestrel. Have you ever seen one? Probably most of you in this room have. You just didn't know. 
So the American kestrel is the smallest falcon in North America. And they are um, my favorite bird. Um, we say that in front of a girl. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what you, they hunt a lot of times, most of the times, from a stationary spot. So you will see them on wires a lot, on the power line wires. And you might think they're a morning dove. So they're that size, okay? We don't have a kestrel with us today, but they're that size. And you probably have all seen it, seen one before, at least probably more than once, but you just didn't realize it. In my backyard last year, well, three years ago, I put up a nest box for American kestrels. And actually, American kestrels can use the same nest box as screech owls and saw weather, just different habitats, okay? So I put up this box to attract kestrels. Kestrels hunt in open fields. And the first year I had squirrels in it. <laughs> of course. The next year I had starlings oh, trying to move in. And I destroyed their nest and blocked the hole. And last year, <laughs> last year I had Kestrels in it. So, and they raised four, they fledged four young, two males and two females. And we watched the whole process from my windows, and my wife was very um, uh, infatuated with it. And she took thousands of photographs. Um, I thought I was bad. This year, I took the box down in March because I was a little bit behind the gun, and I made a new box, and I made it a little bit bigger, give them a little bit more room, and I put a camera in the subroom of it. And it's Wi-Fi to my house, which is about 200 feet away. So early this year, I thought it was early by a couple weeks, the female came back first. Normally the male comes in first, checks out all the houses, and then wait for the female, and then she makes the decision. Right? Isn't that like us? <laughs> so, she arrived first because they were successful there last year. She knew which house she wanted to move into. And she moved in, and I have pictures of her looking around inside. And about eight days later, the male showed up. So we have registered this box with the Peregrine Fund, with the American Festival Partnership through the Peregrine Fund. And it is one of about 4,700 boxes in this country that are registered. And we are documenting successful nests, failed nests, no nests, and so forth. Obviously, none of, most of those don't have cameras in them. Um, I thought it was uh, less invasive rather than going out every week and opening the box and seeing what's going on inside to put a camera in it. And that camera now, um, I can pull it up on my phone right here, but the camera will show us what's going on, when the eggs are laid, when they're hatched, exactly what day. Because believe me, my wife is checking that 500 times a day. And she works. Um, so that will be on our website periodically, updating you on how those kestrels are doing. I like to think of them as my kestrels, but obviously they're not. There are kestrels. And uh, before I get off that topic, I just want to say kestrels are, as I've discussed, are cavity nesters. And their population is in decline. Um, they primarily eat insects and small mammals like mice and moles and so forth like that. Sometimes birds, songbirds. Um, I think the reason they're decline, and science has yet to figure out what the real cause is, but I think what it is is lack of cavities within the nest in, um, and pesticides. So we spray to get the the things that bother us are our lives. And we put rodenticide, rodent poison down for them. Am I going too long, Jim? Is this okay? Okay. I'll get up my 
soapbox if you guys want me to. But the problem with all those things is that they filter up into the predators. And science will bear this out, whether it will be the primary cause or just a contributing cause for Kessel decline. It is one of those things. And so I would ask uh, before I let Jim take over again is that we don't use rodent poison outside of our homes because the, the second generation of rodenticides that we use, and you can buy at Home Depot and Menards and Ace Hardware, and allow the mice to consume it, walk away, and come back multiple times. It takes about eight to 10 days to kill that mouse. The problem then is that mouse is out walking around with this poison in it, and it gets preyed upon by one of these rats, whether it's a kestrel or another one. And so that's passed on to them. And whether it outright kills that bird or, out, or slows it down so it can't hunt and then it starts to death, it's one of those things. So I would ask you not to use, be careful with your use of poisons and pesticides, okay? Um, I wish I had a kestrel here to share with you today, but maybe next year. Okay? Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about our other research project, and I'll get on my soapbox here. Um, the other thing we're doing is trying to test as many of the eagles that we get in this year for lead poisoning. So I am actually kidding. I'm not going to preach, uh, although Julie did offer that I could get behind the pulpit, but I won't. <laughs> so I do want to talk to you sportsmen out there. Now let me say this, I don't gun hunt, but I am a falconer, so I am a hunter, and I also fish. But there is a direct correlation between lead fishing tackle and lead ammunition and lead poisoning in eagles. We've tested seven eagles so far this year. We've had nine admitted already. All seven had levels of lead. Five of them had poisoning. So um, some of those were cases where there were fractures um, that you know, were irreparable, so they had to be euthanized. But I will say this. That affects cognitive function. They're probably more likely to be on a growth kill. And, and a microscopic lead, lead fragment can travel up to 18 inches, like in the, if you shoot a deer. So not just from the standpoint of detecting the birds, but you guys who are you know, deer hunters, you know, think about the fact that you may be building up some lead you know, cumulatively over the years for you and your families. Again, I'm not anti-hunting. I just really want to get you guys to think about considering lead-free alternatives. Um, and, let, and let me know. I'm trying to learn more about this as we go. If you guys find a product that works for you, that you like or you don't like, any information you guys can share would be great. Uh, I will say this. When you're watching uh, Eagle and its head twisted sideways and it's shaking, it's, it's not fun. Um, I've got one right now. We're trying to get it turned around. Uh, I know we've lost a couple that were lead poisoned, so um, it's something that's really important. We just want to get the word out there, and you know, not eagles are top of the food chain predators. So a lot of the things that we learn about eagles pertain to us as humans too. So a lot of the pollutants that they're dealing with, same types of things, the heavy metals in the water, we eat those things, you know, for catching fish out of the Great Lakes. So let's, you know, I just want to encourage you guys to kind of consider some lead free alternatives. And, and give me feedback. If you guys try a box of shells and you like it, share it. Tell me so I can share it with other hunters. Um, you know, I, we just want to see what we can do. You know, my goal when we leave here today is for all you guys to think of one small thing that you can do to help the environment. Whether it's supporting, a, uh, you know, wildlife organizations and organizations that protect them. Yeah, you know, if we all do a little bit, it'll go a lot. Okay, the fun part. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what a raptor is, and I'm going to ask Chris to get Pearl out, and we'll kind of use her to kind of point some of those things out. So we have seven types of raptors in Michigan that we work with. We have hawks, owls, eagles, falcons, vultures, osprey, and harriers. So today we have two types of hawks with us. You guys are going to learn about that. But there are three defining characteristics and that 
um, all raptors have in common. And so we'll talk a little bit about each one when Pearl comes out. Um, and she's a great example. She's pretty big, and so you guys can really kind of see each of those. So the first one is those sharp, uh, most talented that they have on their feet. Um, she's probably going to be a little jumpy. Uh, with COVID, she hasn't been out in public as much as this. Ceiling's uh, kind of got a weird echo. She doesn't seem to like echoes, but we'll let her get settled. And well, it's because she was backwards on the oh, that, yeah. <laughs> So as, you, as Chris walks around throughout the program, you'll be able to see those sharp talons. The word raptor comes from the word, the Latin word for regier, which means to snatch away or grasp quickly. And so that's what they use to capture their prey. Uh, they have that sharp, uh, curved hook beak. They use that to tear the flesh away from their prey. Um, a raptor on the ground is vulnerable, so that is a perfect instrument for uh, getting as much food into them as quickly as possible when you that off the ground. Um, Falcons actually have a unique feature in that they have a notch on the beak and they can actually get between the vertebrae and several spinal cord. 